one's a bit more prospective. This one will focus more specifically on TARP, the various iterations of TARP or, or the proposals that we have on the table, uh, as well as some implications kind of tangential to uh, TARP and similar kinds of innovation. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, briefly I just want to remind you, as always, the blue form is the uh, survey that we use to target these courses and make sure that we're meeting your specific needs. So we ask that before you leave, you put fill that out and uh, hand it to someone uh, waiting by the door on the way out. My name is Saki Thalm and I'm the Director of the Financial Markets Working Group, which is kind of a task force at the McKay Center put together to focus on uh, financial services topics as well as uh, macroeconomic policy and everything else that kind of uh, gets swallowed up in that in that area. So I'll introduce our speakers briefly in order. First is J.W. Barrett, who's a uh, law professor at the George Mason University Law School. Uh, his areas are uh, numerous, but especially uh, securities law, corporate governance, and uh, today he'll be focusing on kind of the, um, the implications, this is a follow-on to a previous presentation if you were at that, the implications of government, government taking ownership stakes in banks and what that means for uh, the, different, the different parties that have an interest in ownership of those banks. Garrett Jones is our, will be our second presenter. He's a professor of economics at George Mason University and a specialist in uh, macroeconomics and growth theory. He will be uh, offering some alternatives to TARP as well as some some comments on the plan that was uh, proposed this week by Treasury Secretary Geithner. Uh, these are alternatives that uh, are not necessarily ex mutually exclusive to current proposals, although some could be substitutes, so uh, I'll let him get into that. And third, we're happy to have uh, Daniel Kaufman, who is now with the Brooklyn's Institution for, or pretty much anything they've done on corruption around the world, and you are familiar with Dr. Kaufman's work. Uh, he's recently been interested in the implications uh, for improper behavior, what they call rent-seeking or corruption, when government, this is not just unique to the U.S. government, but when government takes uh, kind of... So with that, yeah. All right, thanks, and thanks for coming. I'm glad to see I didn't scare everybody off last time. Uh, Warren Buffett is fond of saying when he explains how recessions can tend to uh, bring out uh, all the accounting scandals and tend to sort of uh, show us uh, who's been doing well and who hasn't. He, he, he always just uses the saying, he says, um, when the tide goes out, it's easier to tell who's been swimming naked. And um, I, I would submit to you that when governments own controlling stakes in private industry, they tend to swim naked a lot more. In fact, in some ways, the government sort of mandates that they swim naked. Uh, and I hope that's one of the things to, to get across today. Also, um, take a quick look at the RTC, compare it a little bit to TARP, and see if there's any lessons that, that we should learn and that the Treasury uh, should have remembered uh, from that experience that might be useful in this experience. So under the first, under tranche one of TARP, through the Capital Purchase Program, which is the biggest element of TARP, as you know, capital injections, Treasury took preferred shares, non-voting preferred shares in banks. Um, now, some things, that they, they were technically called non-voting shares, although that's, that wasn't a complete story. We went, over, we went over this in some depth last time. So they were generally non-voting preferred shares, the Treasury held, and the banks participating in TARP. But in the event that the banks miss their dividend payments for six quarters, Treasury gets to nominate two directors. Also, Treasury still gets to vote on merger approvals for banks participating in TARP. If the SEC does proxy access, access to the corporate ballot, allowing shareholders to put nominees on the corporate ballot, I think it's kind of an uncertain question whether or not Treasury would have the ability to put nominees on even though its shares are not voted. That will sort of all depend on what the SEC does. And Treasury also gets warrants to buy common equity. Now, Geithner's plan for the second round of TARP changes things up a little bit. Geithner says, we'll take preferred shares that are convertible preferred shares for banks participating in the second round of TARP that get capital injections. Those convertible preferred shares could be convertible into common stock at the option of the bank. Sometimes banks need a lot of common stock. It's good to have 
a certain ratio of common stock to debt. So uh, Geithner would give banks the option to convert the preferred shares into common stock. His, his, as you know, his uh, second, his recent plan is a little bit short of detail, so it doesn't specify whether or not that common equity will be voting equity. But typically, preferred shares can be limited to non-voting. It's very rare for common equity to be non-voting. So my guess is it would be voting equity, direct voting equity for the treasury. This would be a, another hundred billion to two hundred billion. He also says that the previously held preferred shares that treasury had could also become convertible shares. Uh, at the option of the bank. In addition, it provides this new plan, it's got $100 billion for a public-private partnership that would try to buy up toxic assets and eventually sell them off, create a sort of market for troubled assets. This public-private partnership, very similar to the RTC. I mean, all of this is a little bit similar to the RTC, but this specific plan, uh, very, very analogous to the RTC, and we'll take a look at a minute. Um, at the end of the presentation about um, sort of comparisons and some things that, that maybe you should consider. And then an extra $100 billion to sort of help consumer loan financing and another 50 to help foreclosure mitigation. Now, <clears throat> the implication of governments holding equity in private companies are, I think, fairly severe. There will always be an element of tension between maximizing shareholder wealth and sort of looking out for constituencies, political interest groups, would governments hold equity in private industry. We saw this in the case of Europe. When Europe privatized its industries, it kept uh, minority stakes in airlines and banks and car manufacturers. Those minority stakes were very powerful because they gave European governments the right to veto any mergers of those underlying companies. And Europe basically used them, France and Germany, use that power to limit uh, mergers and acquisitions activities to limit the free flow of capital across uh, borders. In fact, there's a lot of litigation in the European Commission about these so-called golden shares because the other, um, France and Germany's other partners in Europe didn't really think it was very fair that uh, if one of their companies wanted to, say, take over a Volkswagen or, or some bank in France, uh, France would always stop it. To just sort of describe to you what, what sort of tension I'm talking about, um, a very profitable activity for investment banks is financing mergers and acquisitions activity. It's not pretty because what happens is sort of big corporation comes along to small corporation. And big corporation says, you know, if we bought up small part and we merged them into our operations, we could get rid of some of the planned property and equipment at small part. We could lay off some of the people at small part. We'd be much more efficient. We could make the same stuff cheaper. That passes on value um, to shareholders and to customers. So customers and shareholders get to share in that uh, new value created by the M&A activity. So very profitable for the banks participating in TARP, very profitable for uh, Bank of America, very profitable for Citigroup to give loans to big corp to go do this kind of stuff. But imagine when the employees of small corp go to their congressman and say, you know, did you know that Treasury owns shares in this bank? Financing this M&A deal that's going to make me lose my job. <clears throat> now, you may make an assessment that that, that uh, sort of you want to protect jobs, but but I would tell you that the fundamental difference between a capitalist and a socialist economy is a willingness to engage in these sort of efficiency <clears throat> transactions rather than uh, protection of, of uh, sort of uh, well protection of any of the inputs uh, of the factors of production solely for, for the sake of protecting them. And we've already seen a number of interest groups protest um, banks participating in our financing um, M&A activity of, of private insurance. So that's already begun. Um, I have a plan for how to fix this. Um, I think it would be much more useful for Treasury to take uh, frozen options, I call it, which would just be an option to purchase equity in the bank that Treasury could never actually exercise, but the Treasury could sell off to other people who could exercise it. Because it's pretty good, it, it's good to punish shareholders in the bank that need to get bailed out. This sort of limits moral hazard a bit, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a good element of any bailout. You should punish the shareholders, because why should they get the windfall of taxpayer assistance? But um, how you design that equity stake, I think, is very, very important. The Treasury has not adequately considered um, the implications of the equity stakes that it has designed. I think a frozen option would be much better 
and I think also some sort of scheduled sale of those uh, of, of Treasury's equity stakes would also be a good idea. Something like sell off five percent of what we own in each bank every six months for the next uh, six or seven years. Shareholder voting is a is a big power that shareholders have. Shareholder litigation is the other significant power that they've got. So. Well, the size of, of litigation we're talking about here, this is litigation where uh, shareholders uh, say, you know, I bought in or I sold out based on information that the company gave me in its financial statements that turned out to be false. So I'm going to sue and to recover my damages. This is very, this is big money, typically a billion, two billion dollars a year, some blockbuster years. It, it, um, I think when the Enron case settled, it was a 14 billion dollar year for the private securities bar. So Treasury is going to have the opportunity to participate as a lead plaintiff in a lot of litigation, and I see nothing in, in the uh, economic, Emergency Economic Stabilization Act or in Treasury regulations about how it's going to decide to participate in litigation. Is it going to be a lead plaintiff? The other shareholders in, in, the, other shareholders in the class typically depend upon the lead plaintiff to lead the litigation and make all the big decisions. Treasury doesn't have any experience with this sort of thing. The California Pension Fund is a big lead plaintiff. I think it's sort of an analogous case. Um, Treasury will also have state law rights as a shareholder. So when B of A decided to uh, um, execute a deal with Merrill Lynch, uh, the shareholders of Merrill Lynch sued in the Delaware Court of Chancery and said, we want to block this merger from going through. Um, that litigation is ongoing, but Treasury would have the option as a shareholder to file suits of that kind for any kind of M&A activity of any of the banks that it participates in. There are some conflicts, I think, if Treasury were to participate. But one thing that you really want to leave plan is looking out for other shareholders that has an interest in the underlying, um, in, uh, an interest in sort of propping up banks. So they might want to limit the recovery to the other shareholders because it might help the bank continue to loan and continue to do business. Do you want the DOJ or the SEC to get involved? Also some conflicts there. Do you want private uh, law firms to be able to represent Treasury um, that would also be, I think, a bit controversial. Uh, they're big donors to political campaigns, and uh, there have been a lot of cases of, of uh, uh, basically a plaintiff's lawyers uh, giving kickbacks to lead plaintiffs uh, to secure their business. Shareholders also have responsibilities. The insider trading laws, you can't inside trade as a shareholder. But guess what? Government has sovereign immunity from the securities law. That's Section 3C of the Exchange Act. So, conceivably, Treasury, as a regulator, learns all sorts of stuff about banks. Then it could trade these TARP shares, uh, it could take common equity or the preferred shares, it could sell them using the information it has as a regulator. There's no regulation to stop that inside Treasury, and there's definitely nothing in the securities laws to make it liable. Now, I'm not talking about a Treasury employee trading on their own account. That's certainly illegal, but I'm talking about a Treasury employee trading on the Treasury's account on behalf of the Treasury. But uh, other players in the capital markets are aware of this, so why would they buy into banks when they know that the ultimate inside trader is sort of in control of information? Why would you play the game when you know that the game could be rigged? So capital markets could be abused by federal sovereignty in this area. Now, I want to take a look for a minute at the Resolution Trust Corporation. See if there's any lessons we can learn here. I think the institutional memory of the Treasury is a little bit short, and I think that um, there are some things worth considering. First, the Resolution Trust Corporation, depending on how you count, and there are all sorts of different numbers for how much money the government put into the RTC, but I think the best estimate for our purposes is roughly $120 billion into the RTC. So think about this for a moment. Secretary Geithner on Tuesday told us that he's going to put $100 billion into a public-private partnership to buy up distressed assets. $100 billion. The RTC did the same thing 20 years ago. And the size of, the, of these assets was, I don't know, maybe a fourth, third, a fifth, depending on how you count. So Secretary Geithner thinks that he can do this public-private partnership for less money than we needed for the RTC 20 years ago for a much smaller problem than we have now. I just don't think that's even remotely reasonable, and I think he's absolutely going to come back and ask for more money to put into that uh, public-private partnership. And then at that stage, um, all of you will have the opportunity to attach all sorts of strings 
how that money is spent. Um, that's what we saw with the RTC. Over the five-year life of the RTC, this $120 billion started out as 50, then it grew to 120 because they needed to come back asking for money. And every time it did, there were hearings, uh, there were uh, uh, the oversight committees looked back at some lessons learned and some problems uh, in the papers about the RTC and, and changed the management of the RTC and the policies of the RTC. So you, I think you will absolutely have the opportunity to reconsider the structure and design of TARP when uh, the secretary comes back. The life of the RTC was limited to five years. So it had a, it had a half-life. It had an absolute date of death. TARP does not have that. And I think it would be a positive thing to consider doing that for, for TARP in general and um, specifically for the public-private partnership to buy up toxic assets. One of the big problems with the RTC was they significantly underestimated their working capital requirements. So it's all good and well to have a certain amount of money to invest in assets, but just to hold assets for a while is expensive. Holding troubled assets has its own expense. In the time between you buy it and you sell it, you have to spend money to keep it. So, but then at the same time, you don't want to be, you don't want to put um, the public-private partnership in the position of having to quickly sell off the assets that it buys, because then you're really doing no good. Oh, you've got is fire sales now. You've got um, asset dumping that's going to significantly decrease the value of these assets. This is going to result in other banks that still hold these assets having to take write-downs in the value of their assets. So the problem just get, gets worse. So you want to give um, the 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 sort of TARP's version of the RTC a cushion, a good working capital cushion to be able to hold assets. It just gives it a better negotiating position with private purchasers of those assets. Um, so the RTC wanted $50 billion. At one point, the head of the RTC said, yeah, we need $50 billion, but we forgot that we might need another $50 billion in working capital just to be able to hold toxic assets. So I think in this situation as well, we've significantly underestimated the working capital requirements of our public-private partnerships. There was also a cap on the ability of the RTC to issue its own obligations. So I think the, the chairman of the House Banking Committee at the time realized that if the RTC starts issuing its own debt, that debt will ultimately be the responsibility of, of the government, even though it was sort of private debt of this public-private partnership. Um, so he was very careful to, to, to write in uh, limitations on the ability of the RTC to issue its own debt. So, in other words, what I'm talking about here is that, that Congress appropriated $50 billion for the RTC, and then the RTC um, put that money into its account and also issued its own debt to outside parties. So there was a cap. The RTC couldn't issue debt in excess of 85% of the value of the assets it held. It was a 50% cushion there, just realizing that it's really hard to value these things. And so we want to, we want to, um, we definitely don't want more debt than equity in the RTC, and we want at least 15% less, as a matter of fact. I would submit that valuation of toxic assets that we're talking about now is going to be much, much more difficult than valuation of the, of the troubled assets that the RTC was dealing with. So if you do a haircut like this, I would, I, I would talk about something smaller than 85%. But there was also a limitation in, in the ability to the aggregate debt indebtedness that the RTC was able to issue. There was an oversight board of the RTC made up of the HUD secretary, the Treasury secretary, the Fed chair, and two private senior, two, um, two private sector executives. Um, the FDIC was the manager of the RTC at the beginning of its life, and then the RTC was given the option to use other managers besides the FDIC. Um, there was a lot of tension between the oversight board and the RTC itself. Um, I think that tension is a little bit healthy. The oversight board had the, had the authority to approve any strategic decisions of the RTC, any changes in policy. And any, in fact, any time the RTC wanted to change its policies, it had to get the approval of the oversight board. Also, the oversight board had budgetary authority over the RTC. And when you compare that to the Congressional Oversight Panel for TARP, I mean, it's just it, it, it's like a, it, an apples to oranges comparison. The Oversight Panel for TARP doesn't have any of that authority. Basically, all they can do is issue reports that criticize uh, TARP activities, but they don't have any of the authority that the RTC Oversight Board had. The RTC was subject to the Administrative Procedures Act. This means anytime the RTC made a rule, it had to go through um, all of the public notice and comment periods. Uh, there, were also, there are all sorts of restrictions on a federal agency's ability to issue rules under the APA. Um, not the case with TARP. Also, the RTC, by statute, 
was specifically given the authority to sue and could be sued in its corporate capacity. Again, Treasury has sovereignty. And there were limitations written into the economic, Emergency Economic Stabilization Act uh, on the ability to sue Treasury. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it might be worth considering allowing, for instance, private shareholders to sue Treasury or some organism owned by Treasury for insider trading or for um, you know, you're a control person and you have control person liability under state law as a control shareholder. It might be worth considering writing in specific um, liability to, to TARP. Um, also, the rights of action that the RTC had to sue um, participants was also specifically defined in the statute. That's not the case for TARP. Some other just general points. There were regional and national advisory groups set up for the RTC. They had no authority, but they could meet and they could sort of give recommendations to the RTC. This was sort of interest groups' ability to participate. Whistleblower protection for RTC employees. The sort of <coughs> tattletale to, to, to you know, the Congress or, or up to the Treasury Department. There will always be some sort of uh, uh, scandal when, when uh, or, or the opportunity for scandal, the opportunity for conflict, when governments contract with private parties, when governments sell assets to private parties. And so, um, I think this is worth considering. The RTC had a private sector CEO. The Oversight Board's authority was decreased due to tension between the RTC, the FDIC, and the Oversight Board. Um, but it's still, at, at, its very, at, at its ebb, it still had much more authority than the Congressional Oversight Panel for TARP. Has. There were some contract approval policies. Uh, every, basically, every time the RTC came back for more money, its contract approval policies were, were reformed in some way to deal with the, with the current problem. Um, and then there was also an audit committee instituted for the Oversight Board to audit the RTC with, with some of the same authority that a private audit committee that an audit committee would have for a private board of directors. So, I just want to close with. Um, it's worth thinking about the rights and responsibilities that shareholders have. It's worth thinking about the implications of government ownership and private industry. And I think it's also worth uh, digging up the old um, uh, congressional record on the RTC and, and remembering some of the lessons that we learned there and not having to really reinvent the wheel. The Treasury's going to be back to ask for more money, and then at that point, you'll help to, to uh, redesign the structure and the architecture of uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or whatever Secretary Geiger wants to call it. And um, I, I hope that, that uh, adequate consideration is given to, to protect the, not only capital markets, but uh, also minimize the cost of U.S. tax payers. Thank you very much. or 
stuck it in a Swiss bank account. It may just mean that they just made a lot of bad loans. Maybe it was uh, shoddy lending practices. Maybe they just got a bad shock. Maybe it turned out we didn't think that home prices were ever going to fall, but uh, lo and behold, it did. So when banks are insolvent, the normal way we take care of things is we send them to the FDIC to work things out. Um, what does the FDIC do when it uh, supposedly shuts down a bank? Um, when the FDIC shuts down a bank, it does not shut down a bank. I don't know if any of you noticed, but over the last few weeks, um, IndyMac, a few, a few months ago, IndyMac uh, was shut down by the FDIC. What did shutting down mean? Well, it meant that the bank stayed open under FDIC receivership. FDIC receivership is nationalization. It's a temporary kind of nationalization. It's a little bit like uh, the kind of nationalization that bankruptcy judges impose on firms that are insolvent. Um, uh, but it's a kind of nationalization for which we have a standard procedure for how you go into it and how you get out of it. What happens when a bank, uh, when we do the normal thing? When we do the normal thing, ATMs still work, branches stay open, banks still make new loans. Uh, some of my uh, friends in California actually have, I'm in California, so some of my friends actually have uh, accounts at IndyMac. And some of you might have accounts at Wachovia, another bank that went through kind of a similar process, though not strictly speaking the same thing. Uh, and in both cases, you know, the bank stayed open. And for a day or two, there was well, people were wondering, is it really going to work? Is my money going to still be there? And then after a couple of weeks, people just you know, don't still around. <laughs> so many back. So uh, just to have people say there's no such thing, you know, that there's nothing as permanent in Washington D.C. as a temporary program. <laughs> Similarly, there's uh, no such thing as uh, there's nothing's quite as permanent as a bank that's been shut down by the FDIC. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a merger, change the name, but it's still open. So the FDIC then spends a while searching for someone to take over responsibility for the bank's deposits, and it uh, somebody who will take over ownership of the remaining loans. So what the FDIC is, it says, it's, you know, it, it puts up a little. Uh, posting on eBay and says we have a bank that we'd like to sell. Here's what you get on the asset side: you get all these loans, and you get all these bank buildings, you know the branches, and you get all these employees who may or may not stick around if you want to. So here's all the assets: that's the good stuff, the loans, that's money coming into you. And on the downside, you have to uh, pay off all these deposits, um, preferably as in the case of IndyMac um, or with Washington Mutual, um, especially with Washington Mutual. Um, the FDIC looks for, looks for buyers who will promise to guarantee all of the deposits. Not just the FDIC insured ones, but all of the deposits all the way up to the top dollar. So the FDIC can do that quite easily. So part of what I'll spend a little time in this talk doing is pointing out, are the big banks in this country that we're worried about, are they likely to be healthy enough that if the FDIC did <coughs> do the normal thing, that, they, that these banks actually would have enough money to pay off every single depositor as is. And we'll see when, whether that seems likely. Um, so, so eBay, you have, they have this auction up on eBay to say you get these assets and you get these liabilities. It's probably a little more complicated than that, but I don't know the details, right? So, um, and then, you know, as usual in eBay, in the last five minutes of the auction, somebody comes in and snipes and pushes up the price a couple of, quite a bit, and you're kind of annoyed that oh, that sniper got me. But uh, there's a final bid. There's a big chunk of money that somebody says, I'm willing to pay this much for this set of assets and these deposits. Who gets that money? Not the FDIC. That money goes to pay off the old bondholders. So all kinds of security holders in this talk, because it's a short talk, I'll just have focus on long-term bondholders. But the new buyer, new buyer pays off the old bondholders, and if there happens to be money left over, if they bid more than the bondholders um, uh, had that were owed, then the less left over goes to the old shareholders. So, and the new owner, what are they? They are now the 100% shareholders of the new firm. So the key in this process is that the new owner pays off the bondholders for what the firm is worth. That's what the auction is all about. It's saying, what is this bundle of promises, this bundle of good things and bad things worth? Um, and that's what the new owner is going to pay off. Not what the bondholders wish it was worth. So a bank, short of its bondholders, once you cut those bondholders off, a lot of those banks are going to be good banks. It's just a good bank that made too many promises. So, um, when is a bank insolvent? 
Well, as I, I've been implying, some of you probably have taken some, uh, been a, you know, some of you are probably business majors here, or you're taking some kind of basic uh, accounting or finance course, and you know, a bank is insolvent <laughs> the same way that a firm is insolvent, when the liabilities are greater than the assets. So that means, so loan, so the assets of a bank are the loans and the investments. So the, you know, the mortgages, they've lent money to people and they're hoping to get money back in the future. They've bought some shares of some other firm and they're hoping to get money back in the future. They've bought some treasuries or some municipal bonds and they hope to get money back in the future on those. Those are what the assets are. Um, and the liabilities are the deposits, which we're all familiar with, and then bonds. And a lot of these big banks have enormous amounts of bonds. There are other people who are, uh, there are other liabilities out there. So for example, you know, whoever, um, whoever you know, waters the plants at a bank, you know, they probably contract out and have somebody come in and water the plants or somebody mows the lawn. Um, and the bank probably owes them money when it counts payable. Those are all liabilities too. So anything that's about money that's supposed to go out in the future are the liabilities. And the, thing, the difference between assets and liabilities are assets are things where the bank is hoping the money's going to come in. You just kind of cross your fingers and you hope those people are actually going to write the check every month. Or that the auto pay on their, for their mortgage is going to work. And liabilities are things where you're contractually obligated to actually make these stuff on things, which is kind of an asset. Um, so financial crises are all about, uh, well, our current financial crisis in particular, our current financial crisis is just about one simple thing in this, which is one single set of assets, one single chunk of the assets, largely mortgages and things that are based on mortgages, just might not deliver. So the assets, just that money coming in might not happen. Now again, remember this is all about hope and about the future. The income statements of these banks, you know, we've seen some of them are pretty bad. but current cash flow, current money coming in this week, current money going out this week, that's not what this is about. This is about beliefs about the future. If it turns out that we were all wrong about this, that actually people are going to really find a way to pay off these mortgages, just as we found out last year that uh, oil prices really weren't going to be 100, the price of oil wasn't going to be $146 a barrel. We thought it was going to be that way for a long time. We thought it was going to be well over 100 for a long time. I thought we were wrong. So, but, uh, so we're wrong about that. Uh, but so far, it looks like with the mortgages, we think they might not deliver. Again, we might be wrong. The hurricane might pass us. Uh, but uh, based on the best that people can look out there, it looks like uh, some of these, it, unless these guys get some kind of bailout, unless L or A change, it looks like for a lot of these big banks, L is bigger than A. They have a lot of liabilities, money they promise to other people, <coughs> and their assets, especially their mortgages, just aren't worth as much as the problem with that is that nobody trusts a firm when liabilities are greater than assets. People just don't trust them. People think, well, why, why do I want to do business with this bank when they just might not be there tomorrow? Even if I'm gonna, even if I'm going for a loan, which kind of bank am I going to go to a loan to get asked for a loan from? I'm going to go to the bank that um, might not be around tomorrow. There might be new owners. Geithner might come in and put in a new CEO and change all the rules. People might change the, you know, anything could happen. When L is greater than A, people are very concerned. Even if it's just a private private bank, uh, with, even if it's a private firm where there's no threat of extraordinary government intervention. In our current world, you can imagine that anybody who sees that a bank has gotten TARP funds, you're not going to be that excited about going there as a depositor, at least some people won't, and you won't be that excited about going there um, to get a loan. <laughs> so there's two ways to fix this L greater than A problem. And this, is, this gets a little technical here, right? If L is greater than A and you need to change that so that A is greater than L, there's two ways to do that. One is to push L down. That's the FDIC approach. The other approach is to push A up. So either A gets bigger or L gets smaller. Those are the two ways you make a bank healthy. So, and notice, and I should emphasize that the Resolution Trust Corporation approach, the RTC approach that we used with the failed savings and loan, was basically the FDIC approach. It was a... Uh, uh, again, a, basically a beefed up version of finding a way to knock down those liabilities and still you know, sell the assets for what they were worth. So Geithner's, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Paulson's two kinds, two versions of the TARP were all about uh, pushing assets up. One by paying a lot for risky mortgages, another way by just putting shares in the banks. Either way, it was a way to get more cash into these banks and, uh, and not get real liabilities in return. Shares aren't, aren't really aren't like li aren't liabilities like other investments. So um, the the current approach of um, Geithner's new version of TARP 
seems to be about, about half of the money is about like this. It's about um, restructuring the mortgages is, a, little, is a, 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 a beefed up version of this. You must help some people restructure the mortgages so that the U.S. government implicitly is paying part of these folks' mortgage payment every month. Um, so that helps the banks. And he saved $120 billion for buying more shares in banks. The other half of uh, Paulson's TARP is, if you want to put it in these terms, is about um, pulling risk out of the private sector and putting it into the public sector. Basically, finding ways to ensure investors that the, so a lot of this risk out there in these assets, whether it's mortgage-backed securities or other kinds of securities, uh, that these assets uh, will get some insurance from the government. Uh, but again, keep in mind that's all about shifting risk from the <coughs> private sector to the public sector. So the taxpayers take the risk instead of the um, Wall Street investors. Um, Brad DeLong, the, uh, econ the econo economist at Berkeley and former Clinton Treasury official, has pointed out just that's exactly what this is, and he's quite in favor of that. He thinks that the government should be taking more risk and getting it off the hands of the private sector. Um, so uh, the FDIC approach, which is similar to the RTC approach, is, uh, is about making some of those bonds vanish, pushing down the liabilities instead of beefing up the assets. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, economists over the last few months who have come out in favor of some kind of debt write-down as a way to fix this, pushing down the liabilities. Uh, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times was just pushing this point just a few days ago, saying that this is uh, uh, clearly the thing to do now since we've tried these other things. Luigi Singales of the University of Chicago was pushing for this months ago. Uh, he's testified here on the Hill about this, um, and he has uh, been pointing this out from day one. At the time of the, tar of the first part, he was saying, rather than boost A, you should cut L. Um, then Neil Cash after Chicago and Jim Hamilton, um, my dissertation advisor and a blogger, um, has been pointing this out too. He pointed out, pointing out that uh, bailout should not be fun. If people are coming to you to ask for bailouts, that's a sign that you've made it too easy to get a bailout. Nobody asks, nobody gets excited about going to the bankruptcy judge. Nobody gets excited about FDIC receivership. But those are both things, both ways of making unhealthy firms healthy again. So, uh, in, 10, in 30 seconds, how would this happen if you did this to Citigroup? Citigroup's balance sheet, $2 trillion in assets on paper. Maybe it's not really worth that. A lot of those are mortgages. It might not be worth quite that much. On the liability side, they got a lot of long-term debt, but only $700 billion in worldwide deposits. This is the point I want to make. The other big banks are in the same boat. The other big money center banks are in the same boat. Their assets are huge, but a lot of those liabilities are long-term debt and other things that are just a little more complicated than long-term debt. Deposits are usually less than half of the assets. So you can write down a whole lot of these assets. You can admit, okay, yeah, these assets just aren't worth very much. And you, you debt holders, you're not going to get what you thought. And some of these other liabilities, people have other liabilities, they might not get what they got. But my gosh, I'm guessing that out of $2 trillion of Citigroup assets, there's probably $700 billion of value out of there. That's all you need to be able to pay off every single dollar of worldwide deposits in Citi. So, um, so fewer debt promises make a safer city. So we've talked a lot about how our economy is over leveraged. There's too much debt in America. The normal way of resolving the problem of too much debt for a firm or a nation is debt write downs, FDIC receivership, bankruptcy. And we let the good firm go on. So a, a company that's very important to all of you has just gone through this recently, just in the last couple of days. Um, it's the company known as Muzak. Right? They just went into bankruptcy. The judge is letting them stay open. That elevator music is still going to be piped in. The judge is looking at it and saying, they're a good company. We're going to keep the doors open. They're still going to be you know, cranking out this, you know, this wonderful, mellifluous sound. Uh, but those debt holders just aren't going to get all the problems. So uh, that's the model that we approach in many other areas of our life, cutting down liabilities rather than raising assets. And that should uh, at least be, a certainly be an important part of uh, your approach as uh, Secretary Geithner presents the second round of the Thanks.
up uh, a, a few initial remarks. Uh, uh, as a foreigner, and being involved also in the broader issues of, of governance uh, for many, many years and around the world, uh, I will complement the previous presentation not being able to follow the excellent technical footsteps of the presentation on, on very fine details on, on the part, but bring a broader perspective, especially on the question of the game that is extremely important while one focuses on, on each detail of each tree in this forest towards the other side of, of the forest. And in that context, I will bring in two different dimensions, one by, by theme, and that's the dimension that you know you are being under-emphasized in the financial crisis, and that's the, the whole issue of, of governance, of capture, and related uh, also of, of corruption. So it, it brings us also to the realm of the, of the politics and not only thinking that the, in terms of learning lessons for the future, in terms of in addressing the problem can all be done to a technical fix. And the second dimension in bringing in the national dimension is the experience of, of our capital, in particular and all very quickly. And I apologize up front that there are also a number of parts are very quickly because the most important and interesting part is the discussion rather than than the, the topic uh, on my side for too for too long. So without further ado, first on the first issue, and by the way there are, there are some papers yes, including a short piece in Forbes that uh, perhaps I didn't bring enough copies, but it is in Forbes.com that has, I put there on the first issue which is really this governance dimension, corruption dimension, the capture dimension. But I'll, I'll quickly put it on on the table for discussion. Um, and it's essentially to, uh, to suggest that in the whole governance and corruption field, for too long, there has been a misplaced focus on, on very uh, <coughs> rough, overt, and clear forms of illegal corruption, particularly private and administrative, administrative and bureaucratic sphere. And we have uh, for too long under-emphasized and underestimated the whole gray area, which may be extra legal, sometimes it could be legal in a very strict narrow sense, even though it's not necessarily ethical and maybe very, very costly. And we have under-emphasized uh, the non-bureaucratic, non-administrative aspect of, of misgovernment and, and, and bribery and corruption. And particularly in that, in that context, the whole nexus between private sector interests and, uh, and high-level political corruption has been one of those that has under-emphasized. We think that we have done quite a bit of work on the, on the problem around the world, and it varies significantly from country to country, but it is a very prevalent in many, many countries, in many countries of the world, to the problem of capture that uh, we have uh, <coughs> been stressing the notion of state capture, which is essentially the undue influence on the political sphere to uh, affect, to influence the laws, the regulations, and, and the policies of the state. And in some cases, basically uh, affecting the, the whole, all the rules of the game to the network between the private and the political sector, to the detriment of the public policy, to the detriment of uh, <coughs> level. Uh, playing fields for private sector uh, development. And one of the most overt examples of that of the past 15 years is what happened with the oligarchs in Russia, for instance, as, as Russia transited from, from socialism to, to market in terms of very overt, very clear forms of capture. But in a more uh, industrialized world, these expressions have often been much more subtle. Being more subtle does not mean that they, they, they are not costly, as we have seen very clearly in the context of the, of the financial crisis. And that's related very much to the, to the notion that we have advanced of so-called legal corruption, which may be an anathema to, to um, lawyers, 
because what what it does what does that mean? But the, the, that's what I suggested before that the actions may be according to the laws of the particular nation strictly legal in that sense at that moment in time they may be very illegal later on and we will see what comes out of the whole regulatory reform after the the factor. So at, at some point in time the nation may be may be strictly legal but it still basically distorts very significantly the whole sort of the game and not necessarily uh, ethical and it may cause enormous damage and cost to well welfare for a large part of the population. In the financial crisis, a lot has been written, and I'm not going to go in the short period of time I have, in terms of the technocratic failures, even the failures of ignorance, in terms of the failures of the risk model, and in, in terms of some of the institutional setups. But not as much emphasis as has been given in, in terms of the political aspects, in terms of the incentives aspects and in terms of the integrity aspects, which are all related to, to each other and they do, they do matter. Um, in terms of the worldwide perspective, in terms of these, these, prob uh, these problems uh, that I just uh, suggested, um, <coughs> the, the whole issue of legal corruption, vested interest, and regulatory capture they, we suggest that they have played a very important role in terms of the financial, uh, in terms of the financial crisis. The, uh, <clears throat> we can give some examples, but you know it very well, so I'll go very quickly. I mean, what AIG, is based the antecedents of AIG's uh, collapse in that very small unit in, in London, headed by Joe Cassano, 300 plus people, basically, and how they deal with derivatives outside of the oversight framework, they still the oversight regulatory and oversight rules, in some non-transparent approach to the book, and it virtually brings down an NPAR, 130 countries of 100,000 employees. Fred and Tanya are going to go through that, but have also all the efforts of spending millions of dollars by the institution uh, in lobbying lawmakers in an effect in the regulation, the subsidies, the, <coughs> the oversight, and so on, of those institutions. OTS, that's another example, the Office of Free Substitution, in terms of how essentially part of the incentive <coughs> and in an extreme way that they, they capture in not providing the appropriate regulatory framework, basically they were financed and paid by they regularly regulated themselves uh, much more in that story so as to what happened here. I'm sure that's what should come out. Credit rating agencies will know the problem of incentives and essentially also of subtle capture by those <coughs> uh, financial institutions that basically pay for every particular product that they 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 raise so that is another Done. And then the famous April 2004, which I'm talking basically almost five years ago, 2004 meeting in the basement building of the SEC between the, the heads of the largest investment bank. Uh, with the SEC, the meeting takes 55 minutes, and at the end of that meeting, there is a much more lax agreement on a much more lax regulatory and a, a framework for the, the large. Uh, banks in terms of their, their capital <coughs> uh, and requirements and debt that they can undertake much larger than fashion. Uh, they can agree in principle that they will be subject to much more oversight, but that may never take place. These are just some, some illustrations, but it begins to bring in, to bring in the picture that the, the issue is not purely technical, that they are political, that they are cultural elements that need to be taken in. Into account. At the time, we, we were looking at the whole world in terms of governance, and we have specialized for many years in looking at data and governance indicators. So just to give a picture, at the time, in 2004, one data set, which basically they draw, drew from 10,000 different enterprises around the world a picture of the situation as those enterprises saw it in their own countries. Uh, 
So if we look at corporate bribery, a very traditional measure of bribery <coughs> at the time, bribery for procurement, they pay for, to get procurement contracts and other um, that's bri bribery. In a country like like Norway, Sweden, Sweden and others, on average the Nordic countries was extremely low. They really to expose the Nordic. It was a big part in what we call for legal corruption. It can rarely be in measure, but in this case, it did measure because there were questions about the undue influence, even in a legal way, of the regulatory framework, the politically powerful firms weighing in and getting basically regulations, policies, and laws shaped for their benefit to the detriment of the others. Well, we did ask questions. That's so, a little higher than more, but the Nordic was feeling less than a third of the firms were reporting the work that they did from. The G7, by comparison, is much, much higher. This is already 2004. G7, by comparison, in fact, to the, to the tigers in Asia. And if we see the United States, the gap is that much larger. Relatively low primary when corruption in the traditional sense, which is what usually every institution engaged on the study of corruption measures, Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, rates the US number 18 among 118 countries. It's in the top, it's not at the very top, the Nordics are at the very top, but it's in the top 10 percent. percent. But if we go and look at the time in terms of this more murky gray area in terms of capture, legal corruption, we're talking about the U.S. among 100 plus countries being in the middle of the pack, well below a many, basically 50 plus countries, including <coughs> some, some like South Africa, Chile, my own country, and many others, and more or less where Italy was at the, at the time. So obviously it was already in the data, this, this uh, political and more subtle corruption dimension that is you know, under the same. So that was one aspect. Um, that I want to bring to the table. Um, then, uh, in terms of suggestions that come from experiences from other countries, some more successful than others, to mitigate capture and legal corruption, there are some straightforward suggestions. Uh, one is in the political reform arena, political Iraq electoral finance system, in lobbying. Uh, they are important to focus on the reform in lobbying conflict of interest laws, including the whole transparency issue on, on, on that. And there's obviously the question of what has been legal until now should remain legal. Transparency-related reforms is absolutely crucial, and that's something that the government in the U.S. has, has, has recognized. The question, of course, is to with in the details and how it is implemented. The issues of incentives need to be according to the important who comes the regulators, the executive compensation scheme for the medium and long term results, performance driven that are looked at and not the way that it has worked so far. And another uh, implication I wanted to stress that I'll discuss in the next uh, a few minutes, just to try in my remarks, is the importance of broadly learning from other countries. Some other countries have passed a serious financial crisis, and there are some of the lessons with, with some circumspection, obviously, because this financial crisis is in some sense unprecedented, but the context and the interdependence of the European factors is not something that like either in Sweden or in my own country, Chile, both of which underwent many years of financial crisis, can be readily copied as a template because of those differences. Having said that, I'm going to focus a little bit on the case of Chile, for the sake of, of time and also expertise. I'm not going to say that actually very much about Sweden, at least in the main, main remarks. In the case of Chile, it's interesting in terms of some of the similarities in the antecedents. We're talking about the run up to the crisis that goes from late to one to 84, more or less, uh, with very significant. Uh, start the regulation in finance, other aspects too, but it's possibly not in finance, macroeconomic mismanagement, particularly back in the exchange rates, risky reliance on corporate debt, vested interest influencing 
the regulation and the authority. Uh, but the crisis triggers very quickly, very concerted and comprehensive action at three different levels, and that's why the, the issue of stressing the forest and not just each tree is very important. Sound, short and medium term macro management is the first, then quick and effective macro uh, interventions that are more macroeconomic level <coughs> by the central bank. So that's in the production, the corporate and output loans, the safe and the creation of employer banks that's done quite effectively, the temporary purchase of non-performing loans from viable banks and helping to those banks, provision of secure loans to those, those banks, and the government makes itself a subordinated creditor. In this, in this case. And the third very key element there yeah, is institutional reform. It is basically an institutional uh, reform of the whole credential to provide provision of regulatory frameworks. It's a creation at the time of an effective equivalent of the, of the SEC, which nowadays and over the years has a very, very high reputation and very effective. It's an overall an oversight in disclosure and in the potential of regulatory requirements. So one very important factor of the Chilean case, which should not necessarily be a lesson, a lesson to replicate, but it, it should be kept in mind, it was very high cost. The whole pay, pay out uh, uh, exceeding, depending how one counts, 20% of, of, of GDP. Uh, today, Chilean's financial system is very sound and does not require, for now at least, a bailout. Only your lending has been very, the uh, prices are almost frozen. The economy is being subject to, to, a, a, to some kind of a stimulus plan, which is well put, put together. Some lessons may be applicable to the US and Europe, some may not. Let me finish with some broad uh, implications for, for discussion. One is an additional one from, from Chile, which is, again, the importance of the macro. We tend to focus sometimes on, on one institutional detail, uh, but the macro is extremely important. The macro management of the past decades of past in Chile has been a stellar project. It's a huge reserve uh, because of the stabilization fund that Chile has had um, with the proceeds of copper. And that's what's being used for the stimulus package. There is no additional debt with the mess, and there's no breaking of the private pension plans like in the neighboring country in Argentina, for instance. So it's, it comes from a very solid basis, the stimulus plan that's being done. The way it balances the needs of social sector, increases also infrastructure the needs, and, and, and so on is also important to, 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 to watch. Chile also provides some lessons in terms of the stimulus <coughs> plans, how to do effective infrastructure investment through concessions and how to organize those concessions like for roads that is being done in a way that re reduces the probability of recontracting and therefore it reduces the probability of, uh, of high cost and corruption. But that's uh, not so much a topic of today in terms of the stimulus plan that will be more in that uh, way. In terms of a lesson for bailout, as I mentioned before, Sweden, Sweden also provides uh, lessons. They also need to be adapted because obviously they, they another smaller country without the same complexity of the instruments that we see nowadays in the, in the US. But just to impress upon the point that it's not obviously just Chile. I decided to focus on, on Chile because generally that's not uh, done. And let me finish by some general points for, for discussion in terms of the main overarching point of the forest, looking at the forest from an international perspective and not uh, only at the very important each individual tree. It's very important to distinguish forest between first and third order type of challenges and, and priorities. The, the, the whole debate on the bad bank function well, it, it has to be there or not there. It may become very secondary if none of the other fundamentals are, are addressed in terms of the macro. In terms of fundamentals, let me mention the three or four points. The first, which seems from an outsider perspective very much pending, is a very fast and transparent triage of banks. They're writing down the losses, 
uh, to have accurate balance sheet and then identify very quickly the viable banks. I know that it's easier said than done, but uh, it, it seems to be also that that could be a major political commitment. Identify quickly what is the set of unviable banks and say for liquidation of, uh, of, of, of those. And that comes both in Chile and in Sweden as very clear lessons. So the transparency and, and speed in terms of having it and commitment, political commitment included a bank triage and recognize that some are just not viable and want to move very quickly with that. As long as there's a lot of uncertainty about that, the system remains frozen. Big at the same time, one has actually done big and fast as the viable banks with clear strings, obviously without undue breaks. One can recoup a lot of, of the, 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 the loans and the implicit subsidies over time. Chile did that and Sweden did that uh, 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 too. Uh, but temporarily, a risk shifting is important, and that, that was mentioned. But to proceed at this point when there's such a crisis without any dogma. And uh, even for us in, in Chile, and being totally free traders and ideologically uh, driven towards the market, when the situation like that hits, having to have temporarily government ownership, if it has to be that that's the price to pay, as long as it's clearly stated that it is temporary and what the system is to, to recoup. Um, and in that context, the forest being as important as it's tree to tree, having a it's some macro footing. If the macro footing in the short to medium term is not sound, if things can unravel, much of the financial crisis and decisions in addition to the political mention, in addition to the technical, as macro rules as well, in both here in the US and the other regulatory reform is absolutely crucial, but it's not been discussed too much here today for another discussion to did touch upon political reforms, including the whole issue of political finance, political campaign finance, and very much related to the issue of capture that we did discuss and, and your influence in moving forward and restoring the trust and the confidence of the public is, is very important. And obviously, transparency is very important. Minimizing the bailout cost, at least from the lessons of these other countries, has perhaps was not be a major or certainly not the major objective. Sometimes it seems to me as an outside observer that it's an obsession with minimizing the bailout cost. And that can get into such trade-offs that the program basically does not have, have enough control. Yes, in Chile it was very costly, we pay 20%, but in terms of the medium and the long term, the gains were uh, substant substantial. We've got plenty of time for uh, questions if you guys have any. Uh, if I could remind you uh, that uh, if you fill out those blue survey forms uh, for us, then please help us to uh, improve the quality of our courses. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Hi, uh, this question is for uh, Professor Jones. Um, does the FDIC as presently constituted have any mechanism to hive off assets from a failed bank and resolve those separately? And let, let me give you a for instance. Let's say a bank is in the receivership. It's got an enormous vault full of bad assets. The FDIC lines the potential buyer, but that buyer says, well, look, if you can get rid of, get, get those assets out of there, you know, the branch network, the deposit base, the other assets in the book, I kind of like, I'll give you $3 billion for it. But that huge chunk of toxic assets, I don't know what to do with. I, I can't do due diligence on them. I'm afraid even if I do look closely, they're not worth anything. And if you force me to take those, I'm not going to pay a dime for this bank. Um, can the FDIC separately resolve them and hold them for some time, or is the FDIC's only alternative is to say, well, look, you've got to take them, but what I can do is I can help you out by having a huge error completely wiping out the bad bank bondholders. So you basically get the assets for free. You don't, you don't have to hold any capital against them. So if you could address. I, I think you're not in your head like you understand what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. getting at. Um, now, now, I'm not an attorney, so I don't actually know whether there's that hiving off mechanism. But keep in mind that the magic of auctions, and part of the reason economists have gotten so interested in using auctions as a mechanism for selling off institutions, is because the auction tells you what the thing is really worth. So what your, your second approach, which is you just keep knocking off bondholders until you have a bunch of people uh, showing up for the auction, yeah. 
that's a good way to solve it. Because, I mean, I I'm guessing that uh, nobody here in Washington knows what those assets are worth. So they don't know what they're worth paying for them. Um, people on Wall Street don't know what they're worth. I mean, these are very high variance assets. They're really, they're, they're like investing in a, in a uh, biotech company. So very high variance. So um, yeah, the normal way to do it is to just not start keep knocking off bondholders until you have a lot of people show off for the auction. And then probably those, those uh, crazy assets won't turn out to be worth a ton of money, but there's a small chance that, it'll, that they'll make it a lot of money. Thank you. In fact, one of the big ideological debates with the RTC was uh, do they allow um, bidders to cherry pick or do they wholesale? Uh, and that was, there was just a lot of back and forth over that. I think the RTC first started out with a sort of cherry picking. Uh, we sell quickly and we let you just come in and buy what you want. And then it evolved into more of a sort of wholesale, um, uh, you know, kind of like a kid's birthday party. There's a, there's a grab bag, it's got some good stuff in it and some toys that are no fun. But you just sort of, you get the bag of stuff as a, as a whole. Uh, so. Thank you. Uh, this is the first answer to his question. Uh, there is authority under the FDIC Act to create bridge banks, bad banks. The FDIC has done that in the past, so it wouldn't be anything new. Um, and my question, I guess, more for JW is, uh, you know, lots of reforms are done in 2005 for the Bankruptcy Act so that we can net out derivatives and counterparty risk and stuff like that. Uh, and some of the argument for bailing out Bear and others was that, and AIG was, well, we don't have existing mechanisms. And I know you might not be an expert uh, in bankruptcy, but I just want to ask, you know, is your impression, uh, my impression is personally, we actually have a framework that works if we choose to use it. When we don't choose to use it, clearly, uh, you're injecting uncertainty in the process. So I just want to get your take on, from your impression, do you think we actually have an institutional framework that if we chose to use it, would actually work? Um. Yeah, that, that, definitely not my area of expertise, bankruptcy. Uh, Todd Zawicki is the go-to guy for this. He, he helps these things a lot. Um, but uh, so, so whether or not the Bankruptcy Act would be useful for, for, for getting rid of very large investment banks, uh, I don't know. But the process for Lehman Brothers seems to have worked relatively well. I mean, uh, Sotheby's came in, a lot of bidders came in, and, and uh, I think it seems like the Lehman Brothers Issues getting pretty well resolved on its own without issues of systemic risk coming up and sort of the boogeyman that, that, that uh, maybe doesn't even exist or maybe he does exist. I don't know. Um, but it seems like Lemon Brothers has worked well, so I guess that's my best answer to your question. Uh, JW, you mentioned in the, uh, about the Geiger plan um, 100 billion for public private partnership and 100 billion. 200 billion in additional capital injections. In the plan itself, it said they, they would use that money to leverage up to a trillion dollars, I think, in both, yeah. up to two trillion dollars total. Yeah, and that comes from the private sector. Or it's, it's thought to come from the private sector. So for each dollar the government injects, it's expecting to get nine to ten dollars from the, from the private sector. I, I mean, that can, either that or they're expecting Congress to give them more money. <laughs> um, and, so we're and, sure, so, 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 so the total taxpayer liability in the plan is, is the hundred billion. It's, it's right it's that, as of as of now in Guider's plan, yeah. So how, and, and can you speculate on how that might work? Too? Well, yeah. the, just to give the the case of the RTC, the RTC got 120 billion, didn't spend it all, but access to about 120 billion, spent about like 100 billion maybe, and used that to resolve about 415 billion in distressed sort of assets. So there was a four to one leverage, I think, in the RTC. Sort of, just to sort of back of the envelope. So expecting 10 to one. In this public-private partnership, I think it's particularly um, wishful thinking. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe maybe we've got some fancy new financial instruments to do it better than we did in the RTC. I don't know. Um, Geithner obviously knows a lot more about finance than I do, but it still seems to be a little bit wishful thinking to me. I think implicit in that sort of turn a hundred billion into a trillion um, is Congress is going to give us more money. Got it. I have a question, kind of about that. Is there a way to make sure that it wouldn't just be the taxpayer taking that initial hit where, you know, hedge funds and other distressed investors would kind of make up what the land is? I, or is that, is that $100 billion, is it a cushion? Is it, you know, possible to get it back through appreciation of assets and other returns? Hopefully. Hopefully. I mean, I wouldn't believe them when they tell you we might actually make money on TARP. I don't think that's yeah. remotely uh, possible. But 
Um, is it just like a PR disaster if you see, you know, Citadel is making money at the expense of the taxpayer? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be um, too worried about trying to limit limit the participants' upside, but yeah. I understand your point. And, and one of the one of the proposals out there, uh, Lucian Bebchuk had a, a, an op-ed about this, and he continues to write about this. He thinks what we should do is have um, the Treasury sort of act like a public pension fund, in that uh, they take the hundred billion and give it off into you know ten billion sections to each of a bunch of private managers that would use that, and then partner with pri other private entities sort of create a pool of capital and try to make it grow, try to auction off assets and, and uh, buy them up and auction them off. Uh, and, and the managers would be private managers and they'd get a piece of the action. So they would have an incentive to maximize the value. They, they would get paid based on how much they gave back to the taxpayer. Um, that again is going to be controversial because people will say, well, look, if there are people that work for the government that are making millions of dollars, uh, the Harvard Endowment um, was run into all sorts of problems because it had investment managers that could make the endowment grow in ways that no other financial institution could make money grow. And yet people still said, these are university employees making $30 million. It's terrible. Um, so I think that, that would be people's response to a proposal like that, even though maybe uh, it has other drawbacks, but it might be the most efficient way to deal with, with your issue. Yeah. JW, I uh, apologize for coming in late. I was just curious in terms of, um, and I, I may have missed this, but, but in terms of options, why isn't do nothing a, an option that's been analyzed? And, um, and, and given the market reaction yesterday to, to Secretary Geithner's speech, or the day before, rather, um, what, what makes you think, I guess, that this is going to be well received by the market ultimately? I mean, I. I that's a broader question, I guess. Uh, uh, certainly a worthy question, but um, uh, I mean, I think it, 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 it's reasonable to say that uh, moral hazard is a real phenomenon, and that, that uh, last year's bailout leads to next year's irresponsible lending and irresponsible investing. And I think that part of what we're seeing, I think it's fairly accurate to observe, that part of the problem we're seeing now is risk taking that happened because of the RTC. I mean, it was sort of, we were bad, and then the government came in and bailed us out, so now we can sort of be bad again. I, and I think this year's bailout is going to result in the future, perhaps, in changes in risk preferences uh, that might not, that, that might lead to the next bailout that would, that would grow geometrically like the RTC bailout has grown um, uh, compared to the TAR bailout. Oh, the, the TAR bailout has grown compared to the, the RTC bailout. So I don't know if you know, I think there's a politically viable uh, option. Um, but I think it is telling that the market didn't like the uh, Geithner proposal. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I, but uh, today I'm only here to sort of offer within the realm of what's politically viable uh, what might be useful in terms of congressional oversight. Yeah, if, if I can weigh in any outsider to, to, to question. Uh, the one is whether the factor reaction is because it was not voted enough, not because it was. Why, why isn't that being discussed so that at this point, obviously, it's, it's a possibility? 
a tax return, but it's going to be a clear commitment over time. And if the proper incentive is aligned by the bank that an incentive to save it, it itself, but they don't worry about it. That and pay back in the meantime, no dividends and compensation schemes, or, uh, or I mean, all these clear schemes. So, it, it doesn't seem a priori also as an economy because you can either or type of situation that is totally unavoidable, perhaps, and it actually has very high cost at the beginning, but over time it comes down. In the case of Sweden, some analysts suggest that Sweden, Sweden at the end, the net cost was, was zero or less because it did recoup. Of course, it depends which analysts you look at. But if you look at the term for it, it's So you're saying possibly a condition that if you participate in the capital injection program as a bank and then life gets better for you in the future, and you also sell off toxic assets to the public private partnership, you'll have to buy them back when things get better? Well, I'm selling some, some I'm just giving, I'm, yeah, I'm giving an example of what, what has been done in our other case. They have to buy them back. So this was a temp also to resolve the ideological issues of the government in Italy or wherever and so on. And Chile, you know, for, for 25, 30 years, it's been ideological. There's been no question across the spectrum in very few markets. But there was no question that they had to be the great nationalization. Until today, Bank of Chile is still a kind of national strong one. And the rest was also the uh, Can I ask a, a quick question? Uh, looking at Garrett's example of Citibank, it brings to my mind that uh, there's another very large pot of money out there besides taxpayers, and that's debt holders. Exactly. And, uh, you know, especially in the case, I mean, I still have never got a straight answer at uh, Treasury why they subordinated debt holders from Freddie and Haney weren't wiped out, um, other than that Goldman was probably one of them. But that said, uh, you know, my question is uh, you can easily recapitalize all these financial institutions by turning the debt holders into equity holders, and there you go, they're recapitalized. So my question to you, and I think this, I, I don't familiar with Chile as well as I am, some of the other uh, Latin American countries, but certainly lots of other those countries have had their uh, national debts to be severe haircuts, and yet the debt markets still function. So my question to you is, let, let's just say this is politically possible, um, what's the downside of turning the debt holders into equity holders, at least some haircut, 10% haircut, whatever, and it becomes equity? I mean, it's a, that's a political problem, not an economic one. I mean, the FDIC approach is just a roundabout way of debt-to-equity conversion. And debt to equity conversion is the way you turn sick companies into healthy ones. You know, people say that unhealthy companies are ones with huge debt equity ratios. Well, with these big banks um, that have had their, their equity prices fall, those debt to equity ratios, the big money center banks, they're shooting up to infinity, right? A finite number over zero is infinity, right? So those are very, uh, that's a very unhealthy debt to equity ratio. I think any analyst would say that. So the, uh, st the, the way a bankruptcy judge would fix this stuff, if, if they didn't go to FDIC, if they had to go to a bankruptcy judge, a judge could do that over a weekend. Coming on Friday, look at the balance sheets over the weekend. On Monday, he announces all the D in the numerator, that's turning into E in the denominator. That, that, puts, that puts agents who really have skin in the game into running the company. I talked about this in an interview with uh, Fortune magazine a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. It's online now. And um, uh, yes, and the reason why this hasn't happened is a real puzzle. Uh, Luigi Zingales of Chicago says that he thinks it's just because it's basically uh, people protecting their friends. That basically it's these uh, bondholders are, too, are extremely politically powerful. Simon Johnson, who recently was the uh, managing economist at the World Bank and who's now at the Peterson Institute. I'm at the Peterson Institute. I'm at the And uh, he said the same thing. He says that uh, bondholders have become untouchable. And this is very strange. Um, and it's a, I didn't know it was part of America until it just happened over the last four or five months. Bond, all bank debt in the US now appears to be government debt. It says Citibank, it says Wells Fargo on the bond, but people are treating it as if it was government debt. And the government is acting as if it's government debt. So we're, you think people get, people get worked up over the $800 billion bill that's gonna get passed in a, in a day or so. 
Um, but we just created a whole lot more government debt when we decided to turn those one trillion dollars in long-term debt uh, from Citi and Wells and those other banks. Those all got turned into government debt when the government implicitly promised we will never let these banks fail. Actually, in that, in that context, it may be very interesting to look carefully at the experience with Latin America, and as you suggest, not to call the break. Uh, for what? Came back, you know, exactly. Yeah. Right. But, exactly. but the role that Brady and company play in just saying to the top heads of the bank, look, you're not going to get uh, your money back at pay back. It's not much. So let's get together. And essentially, a market was created, like right? a secondary market, created, which functions quite like effectively. I mean, some countries were five cents to the dollar, and other twenty five. We're going to have a policy of, you know, the Chinese are too important for us to make the Chinese central bank and the Japanese central bank take very large hits on, say, their G and their AMA bonds. And we should be honest about it and say that, yeah. rather than midnight phone calls. Also, those guys. All you need to do is write that down. And the, and the Brady approach, again, gets at your, at your approach, which is you have to be willing to go outside the rules in order to accomplish your real goal, which is bring down debt and raise equity. So Brady was a strong Treasury Secretary who just got a bunch of guys in a room and said, it's not going to be the way you thought it was going to be. Um, and what he's, what he's doing is, is the same thing that a bankruptcy judge does. The bankruptcy judges only have to do that with firms that are a couple of million dollars, a couple of hundred million dollars. When you're doing dealing with a trillion, maybe you need a little bit of heavy, you know, bigger gun in the room. So Brady was a, would be a model for that, then, right? One thing I want to emphasize is I, I just quickly um, is um, I, I didn't come here today to object in general to sort of government control or government intervention. Um, what I'm talking about is the, the the difference between bank nationalization, as you call it, when the FDIC uh, goes in to resolve a troubled bank, and nationalization, as in I think think of Fannie and Freddie. Think of government that wasn't a shareholder in Fannie and Freddie, but could put members on the board of directors, could get involved in the day-to-day -day operational decisions and corporate policies of the board of directors of those two institutions, and did so to encourage them to do things that threatened the long-term health of their own finances and the finances of other institutions that they did business with. So that, were, that was two institutions. Government's now a control shareholder in 200 banks. Uh, and so and through the equity that it, that it owns in, this, in those banks, and the equity it's taken through the capital purchase program. 200 Fannie and Freddie's, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. I uh, apologize. We've run out of time here today. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you could join me, thank you. Thank you. Be sure to give us your uh, blue forms on the way out.